questions about anything before we start? Nathan. Yep. No. I, I think I gave you enough info on the problem to today. <laughs> okay, that, that was your first question. Well, what are the, the rest of them? I haven't, I haven't graded them yet. No, I'm sorry. They have moved around a little bit in my house, but they're back to where they were on Thursday, actually. I had them in the do this next area, but then something else went in there and they went back to the dining room. So I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, anyway. I figured, in, yeah, Ian. Just out of curiosity, are you familiar with the FSBW C++ library? Yes. Yeah. Is there any way that you can get to No. Yeah, there's probably someone in here who is, though. I'm having a contact lens issue today. It's rotating 90 degrees, or yeah, so I can't see properly out of my right eye half the time. I apologize for that. So if I, if I call you something other than your real name, like if I call Justin, Amanda, or something, you know, that's why. How did your tournament go? Okay. But not by much. I feel like I lost my one goal. Not but, by much. Um, but it was fun exploring. So on Saturday, we didn't have any games. So we went to Sedona and hiked. Yeah. How about, do you know how Alex's team did? Alex Bitzer? Oh, hey. <laughs> we tied two games. Tied two games? Oh, nice. Well, actually, you know, actually on Facebook, an ECE 3250 alum from a couple of years ago who is now in a master's program at either UNC or Duke. I think it's Duke. He, his team won the f club field hockey championships, nationals, OK? And there was a picture of him with his field hockey stuff on. And I didn't even know men had club field hockey teams, you know, which is kind of cool. But so I thought, well, what, is the, what was it? Was last weekend the Universal Club Sports National Championship weekend or something? Is that? Okay. Any uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, I want to talk about Z transform some more. And and maybe even finish this up. So next week we can talk about singular value decomposition. And remember we had this definition if you're given x in c to the z. So we're always assuming the signals are complex valued. The z transform of x has two parts. It's this formula. x of z is the sum over all n. x of n, z to the minus n. This is the formula. And then you have this region of convergence that always takes the form ra less than magnitude of z less than r sub b where RA equals 0 is allowed, RB equals infinity is allowed, and this is what we call the region of convergence. And essentially, the region of convergence is the set of all Z values for which this series converges. And sometimes it's not quite that, because the series might converge for Z values whose magnitudes are actually equal to R sub A or equal to R sub B. But we don't include them in the region of convergence. It definitely diverges for all the Z's that are strictly outside of that. In other words, Z's with magnitudes less than RA or bigger than R sub B. We had a couple of operational rules. The time shift rule and convolution rule. And the, the thing we had to keep in mind there was you have to lug the region of convergence along with the Z transform formula all the time because in this big list of prototype examples, we saw situations where you had the same formula for x of z, but a different region of convergence. Okay? And that's pretty much where we're at right now. So what I want to do today is I want to carry on with this business about z transforms and LTI systems. And that's basically what we were about to start at the end of class last time.
And after we do that, we're going to talk about the special case where the Z-transform formula reduces to a rational function of Z on the region of convergence. So you don't have to worry about replacing Manish anymore. We, I was saying Tom had counted for four, four bodies in the room, because he's here so rarely. <laughs> not, not because he's a big guy, just because he's here so rarely. <laughs> I mean, that would make Ian count for maybe 1.7 people. How tall are you, anyway? Seems taller to me. I don't know. Anyway, OK. Anyway, so Z transforms in linear time invariant systems. First order of business I want to clear up is, is I want to make sure that you know that the Z transform of a signal, and this includes the formula and the region of convergence, determines the signal uniquely. OK. So I want to note that the Z transform of a Z transformable X determines X. In other words, the correspondence between signals and their Z transforms is one to one. But you do have to keep the region of convergence in mind because of this fact that in the, for example, the prototype examples, you have situations where the same formula is there, but you have a different region of convergence. We actually have an inversion formula that gives you x of n in terms of x of z. But we rarely use that formula in practice because most of the examples we have are for rational z transforms, and for those we have special techniques. Okay, so we actually have an inversion formula that gives x in terms of x, the formula for x, and ROC sub x. So you may say, well, how can you plug the ROC into a formula? Well, I think you'll sort of see how that goes here. But I do want to emphasize we rarely need to use this. OK, so where does the formula come from? First, if ROC sub x, so given ROC sub x is R sub a less than magnitude of z less than R sub b, you pick any R hat that lies in between. R sub a and R sub b. So R hat just has to be a positive number that lies strictly between R sub a and R sub b. Next, define the signal y in c to the z by the formula y of n equals R hat to the minus n x of n for all and in the integers. It will turn out that this signal y is an absolutely summable signal. So y is in little l1. It's absolutely summable. So it has a d tft. Call it y hat. What is y hat? And also, by the way, equation dtft holds because y is an L1 signal. So we have y hat of little omega equals the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity, y of n, e to the minus j n omega. And that's the same as the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity, x of n, r to the minus n, e to the minus j n omega, which is the same as r e to the j omega to the minus n. OK? Now, this series looks kind of like the Z transform. If you took your contacts out, or if you had a similar rotational problem like the one I have today, and you look at it from a distance, this might just look like z. 
r e to the minus r e to the j omega. So it looks like x of n z to the n, z to the minus n summed over n, and this is just x of z evaluated at z equals r e to the j omega, r hat e to the j omega. This is an r hat, by the way, which is you can just write x of r hat e to the j omega for all omega. where x with no hat is just the z transform of little x. And by equation dtft inverse, for y, we have this. We have y of n is 1 over 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi of y hat of little omega e to the j n omega d omega. And if you plug in what y hat of omega is, y hat of omega is just x of r hat e to the j omega and of course y of n is just r to the minus n x of n. So I can multiply both sides of this equation by r to the n, and I get this. This is the inversion formula. x of n equals 1 over 2 pi, integral from minus pi to pi, x of r hat e to the j omega, times r e to the j omega, r hat e to the j omega, to the n d omega, and this is for all n. So here's a nice formula that gives you x in terms of x, of capital X, the z transform of x. And the way you plug the ROC into this formula is by your choice of r hat. And any r hat in between r sub a and r sub b is going to work. This is the same for every r hat between r sub a and r sub b. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, you can rewrite this, and I do this in the monograph, as, as a contour integral. How many people have taken a, a complex analysis course? What, it, was it in the math department? Or? It was in the upland engineering physics. Yeah. So you, you learned about contour integrals and all that. You can rewrite this, and I do it in the monograph, as a what's called a contour integral, but I'm not going to do that here in class. That's more for complex analysis aficionados. And see the monograph for that if you want to learn that. And it's basically it's an integral around the counterclockwise circle of radius r hat in the complex plane of x of z, z to the n minus 1 dz, something like that. All right, so anyway, we have an inversion formula. The z transform determines the signal. So the upshot of this is that the x with the x and ROC x correspondence is 1 to 1. And that's the important takeaway. Okay, so that's item 1. And this derivation, we saw the DTFT come up a little bit here. So it kind of motivates us because the formula for the z-transform and the formula for the DTFT are kind of similar to ask the question, what's the relationship between the z-transform and the DTFT? So here's a general question. What's the relationship between the z-transform and the DTFT. And it is kind of frayed and complicated at the edges, but the core correspondence is pretty tight. First thing to note, and I don't know what I don't think I'm gonna bother writing these things down, is that there are lots of signals that have Z transforms that don't have DTFTs. Like for example, the signal X of N equals three to the N, U of N for all N. That grows exponentially as n goes to infinity. 
No way does that have a DTFT. But it has a Z transform. The Z transform is Z over Z minus 3, region of convergence 3 to infinity. On the other hand, there are signals that we like to think of as having DTFTs, for example, pure sinusoids, e to the jn omega 0, things that have delta functions in their DTFTs. They don't have Z transforms. So on the one hand, you have Z transformable signals with no TDFTs. On the other hand, you have DTFTable signals with no Z transforms. That's what I mean by sort of frayed and complicated at the edges. The one tight piece of the relationship we can talk about is the following. Here's a fact. If x is Z transformable with ROC sub x, whatever it happens to be, and let's say it's r sub a less than magnitude of z less than r sub b. And the unit circle, magnitude of z equals 1, is in rocx, which is the same as saying that 1 lies between r sub a and r sub b. Then, so if x has a z transform and the unit circle lies in the region of convergence, then x has a DTFT. And it's given by the following formula. First of all, the equation DTFT holds. And the formula for x had a little omega. I want to make sure that my wireless isn't on. No. Is this x of e to the j and omega, which is the same as x of z, evaluated at z equals e to the j omega, and that's true for all omega in the reals. The idea here is that the unit circle in the complex, not e to the j and omega, it's just j omega. The unit circle in the complex plane is exactly the set of z values of the form e to the j omega for omega in the reals. The unit circle being in the ROC implies we can plug all those values into the formula for x of z just fine. When we plug them in, we get a function of little omega, and that happens to be the DTFT of x. And that's easy to show in the same way that we showed the DTFT of y up there. And it, you can, some of the other frayed around the edges kind of results are the following. That if 1 is less than r sub a or bigger than r sub b, then x doesn't have a DTFT. That's one thing. If 1 equals r sub a or equals r sub b, x may or may not have a DTFT depending. In the monograph, there are several examples of those various things. Ian? So if the unit circle is not in the ROC, couldn't you easily, like, just looking at the formulas in the Z-transform? Plug in e to the j omega. Well, yeah, plug in e to the j omega, but you have to get the magnitude, so just divide that magnitude out and get this DTFT. Hmm. Okay, I jumped the gun on your question. You, well, I'm not sure what you're... Like, like let's, let's look at an example where the unit circle is not in the region of convergence. Let me, let me pose this as a kind of a rhetorical question with, with a smackdown answer. Okay, so here's a question. Okay, here's a question. Say x of n equals 3 to the n u of n for all n. We know in our hearts that that signal doesn't have a DTFT. Because it grows as n goes to infinity. 
But we know it has a Z transform. <coughs> X of Z is Z over Z minus 3. With this, the region of convergence. Okay? Why can't we just plug e to the j omega into x for this? Because e to the j omega minus 3 is always non-zero. And get this. So clearly, we can plug z equals e to the j omega into the formula and get e to the j omega over e to the j omega minus 3. Why isn't it true that x hat of little omega equals that? That's right. It's not, it, it, but, but independently of that, what's wrong with what I just did? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with what I just did. You can plug e to the j omega in for z here. You do get a well-defined function of omega, but the series defining x of z does not converge to that. Okay. So the key item here, and this is a little bit subtle, is that the series sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of 3 to the n u of n e to the minus j n omega doesn't converge to this. Okay, remember I said the formula could look really simple. Like the formula, whenever you have a z, and we'll get into this a little more later on, Whenever you have a rational <coughs> function of z, it only has a finite number of things that where it blows up. So you could plug anything in the world into that, except for that finite number of things. But the key is that the series defining x of z won't converge to that. And that's why, you know. So I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm not answering your question right, but yeah, I'm try it again. I was wondering, so if, surely if you want to plug in z, Yep, yep. Right. So I say I divide this by 10 to the 59th. So I get 1 over 10 to the 59th up here, 1 over 10 to the 59th down here. How do I clear those out now? Do I? Not quite, because you have your 10 to the 59th appearing at, to a power in every term. So you can't like factor it out of the whole sum. Okay, so, yeah. yeah, you have 10 to the 59th to 0, 10 to the 59th to 1, right. 10 to the 108th, 10 to the 167th, 10 to the... You want me to... <laughs> no. <laughs> is that fair? Okay. Yeah, but, but your question did prompt me to say this, which I think is important, you know. And, and this is one of those things that, for some people, it, for some reason, it slips under people's radar. Why, you know, you can't just plug in e to the j omega all the time in the formula for x, so long as x doesn't have a point where it blows up on the unit circle. So that's the one sort of tight piece of relationship between the DTFT and the Z transform. That if the region of convergence contains a unit circle, then the signal has a, Z a, a DTFT, and it's given as a simple formula in terms of the Z-transform. Okay. And therefore, a system whose Z, tr whose, tr whose, oh, we, and by the way, remember last time, recall from last time, that if a linear time invariant system has a Z transformable impulse response.
h, then the system's transfer function is the z transform of h. So h is z transform is called the transfer function of the system. <laughs> that was a definition we had last time. And some people call it the system function. I think that's kind of boring. I, I like transfer function better. Like, did Peter Dorschach call it transfer function or system function? Yeah. And, and the book, like the book we used last spring, calls it system function. I, I think that's really, anyway. This is more traditional, I don't know, transfer function system. So what does, this, what does this mean in terms of LTI systems, this business about the, the DTFT and the Z transform? Recall also that a linear time invariant system has a frequency response when this impulse response H has a DTFT. Thus, by our result up here, if ROCH contains the unit circle, magnitude of z equals 1, then the system has a frequency response h hat, and it's given by h hat of little omega equals h of e to the j omega, h of z evaluated at z equals e to the j omega for all omega. And that's just because when the unit circle is in a region of convergence, the associated signal has a DTFT and it's given by that formula. So that's yet another way of the z transform touches base with LTI systems. Now we can actually generalize this a little bit. So suppose you have a linear time invariant system that has a transfer function. In other words, it has a Z-transformable impulse response. And you try to drive it with a signal that looks like this. So, so next, Suppose a system has impulse response h, little h, and transfer function capital H along with ROC sub h. Consider whether you, if you're given z0, so given some z0 in the complex numbers, when is the signal x with specification x of n equals z0 to the n for all n. So this is not just z0 to the n u of n or z0 to the n u of minus n minus 1, like in our prototype examples, this is z0 to the n for all n. When is the signal x with that specification in script d sub h? I.e., when does h convolve with x exist? 
when is x an admissible input to the system? Here's an almost complete answer. And, and also, I want you to note that this x has no z transform. Because if you tried to compute the r sub a and the r sub b, you would find that r sub a was equal to r sub b equals magnitude of z0. And that's not allowed for a signal to have a z transform. Here's the fact. If z0 is in the region of convergence for h, then that x up there is in d sub h. And furthermore, s of x, the system operating on x at any time n, is going to equal transfer function evaluated at z0 times z0 to the n for all n. So again, we have this situation where for a special kind of input x, s of x is equal to some number times x. So the z0 to the n is an eigen input to the system when z0 is in ROC sub h. So that is to say, this x is an quote unquote eigen input for the system when z0 is in ROC sub h. That's because. s of x is equal to a number times x, the number being h of z0. OK, why is this true? Let's, let's make sure we believe this. Why? Let's just try to compute. H convolve with x. And see what we get. H convolve with x of n. Definition is the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity. H of k. X of n minus k. Plug in. What x is, x is just z0 to whatever, so it's z0 to the n minus k. We have x equal to z0 to the n. I can factor z0 to the n out of that sum. I get z0 to the minus k left over, and is z0 to the n out here. And because z0 is in the ROC for h, that series in the parentheses converges to capital H of Z0. <coughs> and there you have it. The convolution of H with X exists. That's thing number one. X is in D sub H. And thing number two, it's equal to H of Z0 times Z0 to the n for all n. And that it gives us this little fact here. So now we know how to use transfer functions to handle the response of a linear time invariant system 
that has a transfer function to that special form of input. And it turns out that if x of n is equal to z0 to the n and z0 is strictly bounded away from the ROC, then x is not in d sub h. If, x, if z0 happens to be on the boundary, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But this is the tight, unfrayed, un, you know, difficult part of the result. Okay, now another result that's different from this but is of the same ilk. So it's kind of like a half sibling of, of this result. I, I don't know what you would want to call it. but I, We all have a common ancestor, so anyway, too profound. All right, so a different result, a different question. OK, and so I'm going to try to phrase it the same way we did it. Again, suppose you have a system with a transfer function. So there's something wrong up here. I just want to make sure. No? Fantasy, sports, no? Do you guys have real money on this, by the way? That's we should. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Have you been following the, the recent news, like they're outlawing, yeah. you know, DraftKings yeah. here? Yeah. Because it's gambling and, and we're puritanical Americans. We don't approve of things like that. Okay. Yes. Just, they want money. Right. They want their cut. The government wants its cut of everything. So, and, and under the guise of puritanicality, <laughs> All right. So, uh, who's winning, by the way? I beat John. Collage is winning? Well, he was my manager, and then I fired him because he didn't lose. I lose. You lose? Yeah, and then I. And then I'm not good. I'm not good. Yeah. Actually, this week is the anniversary of what might have been the greatest reception. What's that? No. I, you know, I'm not a huge football fan at all. I'm, I grew up in New Jersey, so I watched the Giants. This is for you at home as well. I, so I, I, you know, like the Giants, whatever, I cheer for them when they're good. And I just happened to be watching this game against Dallas about a year ago this week. And one of their receivers made this absurd catch, you know. And I still, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen a better catch. Yeah, that one where he jumped up in the air and he caught it with one hand and he brought it down to his body as he fell flat on his back. And it didn't move. It was incredible. And, you know, I thought, oh, there's probably been better ones. But no, I don't think so, honestly. <laughs> All right, so a different question. Say uh, you have the same kind of system. Suppose you have a Z transformable input X. Suppose X is a sort of a candidate input. Signal with a Z transform. So X is not like this X up here. This X had no Z transform. Capital X along with an ROC. Question is, when is x in d sub h? And if x is in d sub h, how might you use the transforms to figure out x? s of x. So how do we use z transforms? get h can evolve with x. The answer, an almost complete answer, again, there are fuzzy borderline cases.
but it follows directly from the convolution rule for Z-transforms that, and I'll let you tell me what the rule is. I'll, I'll leave the blank in the appropriate place. So here's a fact. If something, then x is in d sub h, in which case y equals h convolved with x has z transform with specification y of z equals something and rocy something. Okay, so fill in these blanks for me. If what is true, then x is in d sub h. Will? Yes, yes, non empty. ROC H intersect ROC X not equal to the empty set, then X is in D sub H. That's by the convolution rule that we talked about last time. And what is Y of Z, the Z transform of H convolved with X? What is the specification for the formula part of Y of Z? Somebody other than Will, I know he knows the answer because. <clears throat> what is Nathan? Yes. And what, what were you saying about the ROC? Why? Well, it's usually equal, but it actually contains the intersection, is the most general thing you can say. Because it, it turns out that sometimes it's bigger. But in any event, this is a simple sufficient condition for a Z-transformable input to be admissible to the system, to be convolvable with H. And here is the Z-transform of the output. So if, if this holds, the, the answer to the first question, this is a, this is a almost complete answer to the first question. And the answer to the second question, how do you get H convolved with X? You first take the Z-transform of, of X. You compute y of z this way, and then you, however you do it, inverting, you get y of n. Okay, so to get y equals h convolved with x here, you can compute the z transform of y and invert, either using the inversion formula or using the convenient criteria we'll discuss presently. You don't have to compute a convolution by hand. So that's the advantage there. And these situations are different. They're, they're different because in one case you're dealing with a special class of inputs that don't have Z-transforms. In the other case you're dealing with Z-transformable inputs. But in both cases you see how the transfer function, how the Z-transform plays into the theory of LTI systems. Okay, so let's take the three-minute break, and then we'll talk about rational Z-transforms, which we talked about some last spring. But it's different this semester because we have two-sided Z-transforms and all that. It's secret. It's only it's private. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, just kidding. There's a, there's this course called Digital Signal Processing EC4250, and it's been through various generations and different instructors. And Professor Tsu Han Chen, who was our at director for five years, and he, he taught it a couple of times, and he turned it last spring into a CDE, which is a kind of a designy kind of centered course. And everyone loved it last spring. And 
Unfortunately, he's on leave now. So we were thinking, oh, we're not going to offer it. So now we're, we're actually offering. So it's digital signal processing. I don't know what time it is. At 840. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, so anyway, now what we're going to do is we're going to now focus next on it, the special situation so focus next on a special case but even though it's a special case it's very important special case and it's generally the only things you ever have to deal with in real life so I'll say it's not too special David What's that? I missed a board. It's uh, okay. It's a really old board. It's going the wrong way. It's okay. All right. Let's see. They go in this order. So that one is the one I should be using? No. The second half of that board is old material. Middle board. Yeah. Oh yeah, we did use that. Okay. Okay. So it's it's not. <laughs> so this is still kind of old. What I just erased. All right. That's that's like Paleolithic, and this is Precambrian, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. And the special case is when x of z, the formula for the z transform is a proper rational function of z. Now what does that mean? That means that if you write the formula down for x of z, it's a ratio of polynomials in z, let's call it say p of z over q of z, where these are both polynomials They're not things like sine of z or e to the z or anything like that. They're things like z squared plus 7z plus 12, you know, whatever. And the degree of p of z is at most equal to the degree of q of z. That's proper. Rational means ratio of polynomials. If you write p and q in lowest terms, p over q in lowest terms, cancel all the common factors. You can always assume you've done that. Then, so if p and q don't have common factors, Then the roots of p are called the zeros of x of z. And I'm not sure, as I always say, I'm not sure whether zeros has an e in it or between the o and the s or not. I always put it in. So x of those is equal to zero. And the roots of Q are the poles of X of Z. And X of those equals infinity in quotes, because it might not even converge in a nice way to infinity. So you, you're not allowed to plug poles into X of Z, for sure. Now, it turns out that the following fact is true. And there's a proof in the monograph I'm not going to go over it that the following facts are true about the region of convergence of the Z transform
when the formula part happens to be rational. So it turns out, that first off, no pole of x of z lies in ROCx, where ROCx is the region of convergence for x of z as a z-transform. And second of all, any finite boundary circle of ROCx, say R sub a or R sub b circle, has to have at least one pole of x of z on it. So any finite, and you'll see what I mean in a second when we go through an example, boundary circle, that is to say magnitude of z equals r sub a and or magnitude of z equals r sub b of rocx, is going to contain at least one pole of x of z. That's, those are two things that are true. And finally, because there's no poles in the region of convergence of x of z, and the region of convergence is this annular region, this donut-shaped region, the ROC x is going to split the poles of x of z into two parts. Into what I call inward poles. Those are poles with magnitudes less than or equal to r sub a. And outward poles. And those are the ones with magnitudes bigger than or equal to r sub b. So those are facts about any z transform whose formula part happens to be a rational function. So let me just put an example on the board. So for example, suppose x of z is equal to, say, z squared divided by z minus 1, z minus 2, and z plus 3, say. Okay? That's the formula part. What are the poles? What are the poles of x of z? Quickly. 1, 2, and minus 3. Excellent. Okay, which ones are the inward poles? Can you answer that question? No, because we don't know the RC. Okay, but we know from the first two items there that there's only a few possibilities for the ROC. Here's the possible ROC X's for this formula. There's going to be four. What do you think? That, what, what's... One of them is going to be 0 less than magnitude of z less than 1. What's another one going to be? Remember, the ROC can't contain any of the poles, and any of its finite boundary circles has to have a pole, one or more poles on it. What's another one? 1 and 2, yeah. 1 less magnitude of z less than 2, you get the point. 2 to 3. And 3 to infinity. And for each of these ROCs, or R's OC, whatever the plural of ROC is, corresponds a signal that has that as the formula part of its Z-transform. So if someone comes up to you in Hope Plaza, Nathan. Why, what? Say it again. 
okay, 1, 2, and 3 cannot be, or 1, 2, and minus 3 are not allowed to be in the ROC, right? Okay, and any finite boundary circle, Z equals R sub A or Z equals R sub B in magnitude, has to contain at least one pole. So, got it, okay. All right, so anyway, there's, there's, if someone comes up to you in a whole plaza, remember last time I said, they give you this formula. They say, here's X of Z. What is, what is X of N? And all they give you is the formula. And I said, well, you could be rude, you could be silent, you can say, well, I need the ROC. Well, actually, you know, if it's rational, there's only going to be four possible answers. And so it's not like there's an infinity of possible answers. It's, it's, it's narrowed down some. Okay, so in, anyway, w what about the inward outward pole thing here? For each of those regions of convergence, You're going to have the set of poles divided into inward and outward poles. So what are the inward poles for, say, 1 less than magnitude of z less than 2? A good thing to do in this situation is to draw a picture. So here are the poles. Put little x's where the poles are. And this is one of the regions of convergence, this zone in here. Another one is the band between 1 and 2. So what are the in, inward poles for that one, the band between 1 and 2? The inward poles are the ones that are inside, in the sense of toward 0, in the complex plane of the region of convergence. So when the region of convergence is z, 0 less than z less than 1, they're all outward poles because there's no poles inside of zero. One less than magnitude of z less than two. One is inward. Two and minus three are outward. Two less than z less than three. Is this coming across here? One and two are inward and three is outward. And 3 to infinity, they're all inward. Get it? See what I'm talking about here? Like, let's do one example. The, the, the 1 to 2. So this is your region of convergence. The inward, the only pole inward towards 0 from this ROC is the one here, and that's 1. Whereas the ones that are outward of it, toward infinity, are 2 and minus 3. That's what I mean by inward and outward. All right, so what do we do? What do we do to find x, the signal that goes with the z transformed, given that we have a region of convergence? I'm going to give you a recipe. Okay. The recipe for finding x given a rational x of z along with ROC x. Okay, and I'm going to give you the recipe. I'm going to tell you the, the abstract version of each step of the recipe and then implement that step on this example. Okay? First of all, you take x of z over z, and you guys have seen us, see, we did this last spring a little bit, take x of z over z, and because x of z is a proper rational function, this is going to be a strictly proper rational function, its degree is going to be, of the denominator is going to be strictly bigger than the degree of the numerator, and expand it in partial fractions. So that's the first step, all right? And you can do partial fractions any way you like. You can do it on MATLAB, but the way we do it, <laughs> right? Alex got good at it last, Frank, as I recall. 
Okay. So, so in the example, in the example above. Okay. So, what is x of z over z? X of z over z is z over z minus one, z minus two, z minus three, z plus three. And you can use MATLAB or whatever to do the partial fraction expansion. But the way I like to do it in class is this technique called partial fractions by Zen. Okay. Here's how you do it. You know that you're going to have a term over z minus 1, and a term over z minus 2, and a term over z plus 3. And you don't know what the numbers are going to be. So you step back and you kind of stare at the board, and the numbers kind of appear slowly. <laughs> so this one is minus 1 fourth. Okay. This one is two fifths. And this one is three halves, I think. <laughs> no, this is partial fractions by Zen. You if you have to it's, it takes practice. You know, you <laughs> Right. And it, you know, the thing the thing that's good is that even when your contact lenses are messed up the numbers appear. So I, I don't know, you might want to check me on that, but I think those are, those are the uh, correct, correct ones. Anyway, uh, no, actually, they're not correct. Um, this one is not correct. I just realized that, uh, okay, I have to do that one again. It's no, it's minus three twentieths. <laughs> Justin? Yeah, that, that was my problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me see make sure I believe that. I'm gonna secretly do a uh, a Zen check. <laughs> Okay, you're not allowed to see what I just did. Okay. <laughs> Pay no attention to the person behind the curtain. Okay, so anyway, that, you expand that in partial fractions. Next, you multiply through by z. And the reason you do that is to make it look like the prototype examples. The prototype examples were all the form z over z minus something. Those are the easy ones. The, the harder ones come from the higher order poles. I don't want to waste time on that in class. The Zen is really hard in that case. You have to be sort of a black belt to do it by Zen when you have higher order poles than one. But probably Hans Beta could do it. You know, people like that. People who are like really good calculating things. So then you, you multiply through by Z. And you get x of z as a sum of formulas that look like the prototype examples. So in this, in this particular problem, you have x of z. Just simply multiply through by z. So I get a minus 1 fourth z over z minus 1 plus a two-fifths z over z minus 2 plus a minus 3 twentieths z over z plus 3. All right. Now, how do you find x? Now is when the ROC comes in. So finally, you find x of n. You find your signal little x by looking up on the table of prototype examples. So using prototype examples, and the way you use the prototype examples, you use the 
the, uh, the U of n prototype examples for the inward pole terms, and the U of minus n minus 1 prototype examples for the outward pole terms. So you use the quote unquote U of n examples on the inward pole terms and the uh, quote unquote u of minus n minus 1 examples on the outward pole terms. So, given our four possible R's OC, so thus, for this x in our example, if ROCX is 0 less than magnitude z less than 1, then x, the signal that goes along with that, because now all the poles are outward, x of n is going to equal 1 fourth u of minus n minus 1 minus 2 fifths times 2 to the n u of minus n minus 1 plus 3 twentieths times minus 3 to the n u of minus n minus 1 because all the terms are outward pole terms. If the ROC x is 1 less than mag z less than 2 then suddenly I have an inward pole. So x of n is now equal to minus 1 fourth u of n plus the same other two terms. And if I'm the next ROC out is going to be the 2 to 3 one. So now we're getting even more specific about what you can tell your whole plaza friend or quarter carter. You can say, well, there's four possibilities for X depending on the ROC. There's one, there's one, and here's the other two. And by the way, it, it would be fair on the final exam, for example, for me to say, here's a rational function. What are the, what are the possible x of n's that go along with this as a z-transform formula? And you would have to go through this. So 2 less than magnitude of z less than 3. And you don't have to use n for the partial fractions on, on an exam. You can do it any way you want. x of n is then going to equal minus 1 fourth u of n plus, where is it, 2 fifths times 2 to the n u of n plus 3 twentieths times minus 3 to the n u of minus n minus 1. And finally, when you're in the 3 to infinity mode, all the poles are inward. And x of n is this. And you have to keep your minus sign straight because remember the, the prototype examples with the u of minus n minus 1 have a minus sign in front of them. So there you go. That's the recipe. And, and there's a proof of this in the monograph. And it just, I don't think it pays to spend a lot of class time proving it's true. But that's how you do it. And, and so back to our original question, you know, like, remember we talked about using that we hardly ever use the inversion formula for z-transforms. Well, this is why. Because all of the examples we encounter in our, you know, sort of toy problem life as ECE majors have rational functions, right? So all you have to do is this. You don't have to ever do a contour integral or, or whatever. Okay, so any questions about this? All right, well, why don't we just leave it at that for today and have a good weekend, everybody. I hope you enjoy whatever you do. 
Anybody else going to be driving on the Mass Pike tomorrow? Yeah. It's actually, it's, the weather's supposed to be good, so that's, that's a big plus.